Good afternoon, everyone. This year, we are commemorating the 500th anniversary of the Philippine part in the first circumnavigation of the world from March 16 to end of to October 28, 2021. Together with the National Quincentennial Committee, we are one in commemorating the 500th anniversary of the victory at Mactan on April 27, 2021. To support this Quincentennial, we are featuring a two-part series on the making of the biggest diorama on the Battle of Mactan. Our first talk today will touch on the historical research which laid the groundwork for the diorama. Our second talk next week will be on the conceptualization and execution of the diorama details and design. This live stream is made possible by National Historical Commission of the Philippines through its National Quincentennial Committee. Sulu Garden Foundation, located at Magyao, Iloilo. Iloilo, Museum of Contemporary Art at Manduriao, Iloilo. Chinatown Museum at Binondo, Manila. And lastly, Vibal Group. Thank you for joining us on the first talk of this interesting series about the making of the biggest diorama on the Battle of Mactan. I am Janine, and I'll be your host for today. To set the tone of our talk, we would like to share an animated video of the Battle of Mactan created by Sulu Garden Foundation. set the ambience for today's talk. So just to give an introduction of our speaker today, Dr. Danilo Herona is the director of Magellan, Magellan Studies Center. He is a member of the Sevilla 2019 to 2022, which coordinates the global coordination and celebration of the fifth centenary of Magellan's circumnavigation of the world. He published his book, Ferdinand Magellan, The Armada de Maluco, and the European discovery of the Philippines last 2016. This research was based on primary sources of Ferdinand Magellan's chronicler Antonio Pigafetta. He has since used this research for multiple lectures across Europe regarding Ferdinand Magellan. 
This research served as reference for Sulu Garden Foundation's biggest diorama on the Battle of Mactan. Please all welcome Dr. Herona. Good afternoon, sir. Could you please unmute? Okay. Thank you very much for the uh, generous introduction, Anthony. Uh, let me now proceed um, with the presentation on the research on the Battle of Mactan. Well, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to Jonathan Matias, a good friend of mine, and for um, uh, asking me to serve as the consultant uh, for historical research on the um, on the diorama. I, I was there for quite some time in several years ago, and that's the first time we met, and that's how the idea came into his mind of uh, putting up a diorama. Of course, I would like to acknowledge the following person of my university president, Dr. Bernicina, the Ambassador Kuki Feria of the, um, um, the Philippine Embassy in Portugal, and uh, the Nueva Casas Heritage. This is the book that. Um, that was the result of that research and um, much of what we have in in this little garden uh, diorama is taken from this, uh, this book. Earlier on, much of what we know about the Battle of Mactan is actually derived from um, Antonio Picapeta. This is uh, a picture in the plaza in uh, Vicenza. Where, Magella, where Pigapeta uh, was born and lived for a while, and then, um, and then he, when he worked in Spain, that's where he knew of the expedition and joined the expedition. But this is the, uh, this is uh, Pigapeta, uh, as far as we know. That's how uh, the best that we can have an image of who he was. Uh, although we don't really know how he really looked like, but that's probably the best that we have based on the imaginations and probably based on the data that the people of Vicentia, his uh, birthplace, had of him. Uh, as I said, since the, uh, after the, the, the Magellan expedition, when the Magellan expedition returned in 1522, uh, Pigapeta published his work, this chronicle, and so it became a sort of an, uh, a major source of information as the world was hungry for um, information as to what happened in the expedition and as to what uh, uh, lands they found, the, the work of Picapeta became a major source of information. Although contrary to what we have been told for a long time, for the last 500 years, we always believe that Picapeta was actually the official chronicler of the expedition. He was not. He was not actually, he was a nobody in the expedition. He was there only as an alternate, a sobresaliente. But then on his own account, on his own personal initiative, he started writing down what, as to, uh, what he had seen in the expedition and came up with a book. And that's how we have an information derived from Antonio Pigapeta. But um, succeeding researches, especially in the later centuries, would reveal to us that Pigapeta is not the only source of information. Yet, it was a very, very important uh, 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 source of information in the early period of the, of, uh, of, uh, the writings of uh, the history of navigation, uh, especially on the part of the Europeans. Now, because of what we have um, learned from Pigapeta, and as we said, as we geared towards the 500 years, especially uh, in the last uh, 50 years of the previous century, we begin to uncover a lot of information which we have not been aware of uh, for the last 450 years. As we said, we always thought that the main source of information on the Magellan expedition, and especially on the Battle of Mactan, came from the Pigapeta Chronicle. But um, as more researches are undertaken, we begin to become familiar with a larger picture of 
the Battle of Mactan, and the Magellan Expedition. Where do we get these materials? Most of them are taken from the archives. Definitely not from the Philippine archives because the Philippine archives only was created in the 18th century and we are talking of the 16th century. So the main source of information comes from the European archives, in particular, the archives of Spain, the archives of Portugal, and the archives of Italy. The reason? Because one of the major uh, crew of the expedition, Antonio Pigapetta, was an Italian, and therefore he kept a, his document, his diary, at least as we know, in one of these archives in Italy. Then we know that major sources of information could also be found in the um, archives in Portugal because Magellan was Portuguese. And of course, because the expedition was commissioned by Spain, so much of the information we got from the archives of Spain. And here we have the archives. Um, here we have the Archivo Franciscano Ibero Oriental, though this is a religious archives and you have to understand that the Franciscans came to the Philippines only in 1578. There are also occasional information, secondary sources, as you might probably say, among historians, yet they reveal certain, they provide certain um, um, information that fills up the gaps that primary sources could not provide us. And that's the reason why it is also important to consult the archives of the religious orders who work in the Philippines because of certain informations that are preserved in their archival records. We also have, I also have to consult the documents from the Biblioteca Nacional de España, the National Archives of Spain, because although it's actually a, an, an, a national library, biblioteca, although it's a biblioteca, there are occasional documents, manuscripts, that are kept in the Biblioteca Nacional. Among them were the works, the diaries of um, Gines de Mapra, one of the members of the expedition of Magellan, and therefore he kept a very, very interesting account on the Battle of Mactan. And this is an eyewitness account, which of course, earlier on, we are not familiar with, because as I said, much of the information we derived in reconstructing the narratives of the Battle of Mactan came exclusively from Antonio Tigapeta. The other, another important archive for Filipino historians who are interested to do research in Spain, even including that of the early years of the Spanish conquest, including the expedition of Magellan, there could be uh, occasional um, documents that would, you would encounter at the Real Academia de la Historia in Madrid. So these archives are all located in, uh, in Madrid. Other sources of information could be from the other province of Spain in Valladolid. The Archivo del Museo Oriental de Padres Agostinos de Valladolid contained very, very interesting materials. The reason is because of the fact that Valladolid is an important city. In fact, the contract between Magellan and, um, and Charles V, when Magellan was given a go signal by Charles to go with the, uh, in the expedition, was actually signed in the monastery in Valladolid. We have to understand that Valladolid is also um, the birthplace of Philip II of Spain, and for that reason, a very, very important uh, place in the history of the royal family of Spain. But the most important reason why we have occasional documents useful in reconstructing the Battle of Mactan and even certain episodes in the, in the Magellan expedition was because of the fact that the, it was the major repository of documents of the Augustinian friars. We have to again understand that the Augustinians were the first missionary orders that came to the Philippines and evangelized the Philippines. They came contrary again to popular belief from what we know in Philippine history that the Augustinians began their evangelization in the Philippines only with the coming of the Legaspe 
or the Reta expedition in 1565 actually does not very, very uh, precise. The reason is because the, of the fact that as early as 1542, 1543, so in a way 20 years after the Magellan expedition had uh, returned to Spain, the Augustinians were already in the Philippines. Four or five Augustinians joined the um, Roy Lopez de Villadeus expedition and they already uh, made a landfall in some parts of the Philippines, including probably the clusters of islands near Cebu. And for that reason, they were familiar with what was going on in the Philippines and probably they could fill up certain gaps as to the culture of the Cebuanos and, and, and uh, probably Bactan during this particular period. But we know for a fact that one of the uh, early um, missionaries of the Augustinians kept a very, very interesting account on the Battle of Mactan, and that's the reason why uh, uh, Fray Argandur Murit, uh, that's the name of the missionary, and for that reason, it filled up a um, significant portion of the, uh, of the, the puzzle on the Battle of Mactan, which was um, which we probably did not uh, have based only on the sources of information from uh, Pigapeta. Then there is another source of information, the Torre do Tombo in Lisbon and Portugal. As I said earlier, Magellan is a Portuguese, and the Portuguese were very, very eager to uh, keep um, a, a record and uh, to track down what was going on in the expedition, not because they were happy with the expedition, but because they were afraid that the expedition would succeed because of the fact that Magellan, who was a native of Portugal, uh, shifted allegiance to, uh, from Portugal to Spain, and therefore they were afraid that they would be, it would be an embarrassment on their part if Magellan's expedition would succeed. But then, when I was doing research in the Torre do Tombo archives, I was told that there would be 10 or 100 kilometers more of documents and books that had not been classified. Imagine, at least 10 kilometers, if you just imagine, it would be substantial materials which we probably would probably fill up substantial gaps in our understanding of the early expeditions in the Philippines. The other um, uh, important source here would be the Ambrosiana Library. The Ambrosiana Library is in Milan, but it was there in Milan, in the Ambrosiana Library, that the Pigapetta Diary in original Italian was actually preserved. And probably that's the only place where we have the original um, um, Italian diary of Antonio Pigapetta, because of course Pigapetta was an Italian and um, he lived in Vicenza, which is um, very uh, quite close to Milan. The other source of information would be the Archivo Historico Nacional, uh, although the Archivo Historico Nacional dealt with 19th century, and yet there are occasional materials uh, that are pertaining to the early period of um, the Spanish conquest. The lower picture here reflects the Museo Naval. It shows the Museo Naval. The Museo Naval is uh, one of the largest uh, ar naval archives of Spain. And we have to understand that because Magellan was a sailor, and Sebastian del Cano were sailors, and of course the, the Magellan expedition was an ex expedition of the Navy, therefore occasional materials were also kept in these archives. In fact, one of the most important source of, ma of materials on, on the Magellan expedition, for those who cannot read, the paleography of the 16th century could rely on the collections of documents of Martin Fernandez Navarrete at the Museo Naval. It's a very, very important repository of archival documents. The, although it's not included here, uh, I think I missed the point, I missed the, missed the image. The most important source of the Magellan Expedition's uh, documents could be at the Archivo General de Indias in Seville, which I spent a lot of time going over the documents in order to exhaust whatever materials we have on the Magellan Expedition. The manuscripts, just to give you a feel as to how difficult it is to read the 16th century document. This is an example of a document written by a Portuguese chronicler, an escribao or a clerk by the name of Duarte Barbosa. For those who are familiar with Asian history, one of the earliest materials that we have which describes Southeast Asia was the work of Duarte Barbosa. It's in Portuguese, it says, 
o libro de Duarte Barbosa. And this is how Duarte Barbosa, in, his, in its original handwriting, how he described Southeast Asia at the time. And quite interesting, it also mentioned the earliest material that mentioned of certain parts of the Philippines. This book of Duarte Barbosa was actually written in 1515, six years before Magellan landed in the Philippines. And yet, Duarte Barbosa already mentioned of two islands in the Philippines, Sulu, Solor in the original manuscript, but it refers to Sulu, and Tindaya, which is actually referring to Samar. Imagine, six years before Magellan had landed in the Philippines, there was already somebody who wrote about these islands um, in the Philippines in the, from the perspective of a Portuguese uh, escribao. This is the signature of Duarte Barbosa. These are the signatures of some of the crew of the Magellan expedition. We have the signature of Acurio, Espinosa. Albo is another, is a geographer of the expedition. Very, the work of Francisco Albo is a very, very important source of information for looking at the geography of the Magellan expedition. Andres de San Martin was actually the astronomer or the astrologer of the expedition. Uh, Mafra, Rodriguez de Serrano were, were among the major players uh, on the expedition. Just again, another uh, example of the difficulty of reading the paleography of the 16th century documents. This is the document of uh, Francisco Albo, the geographer of the expedition. He was the one who was plotting the course of the Magellan expedition. So we get to know of the location of Mactan and Cebu based on this uh, account of Francisco Albo. Again, another, another important document. Uh, it, uh, one document here says, uh, this is how one, if anybody wanted to do research, this is how you do it. You fill up certain, uh, certain uh, uh, papers and you request for the document. And this is how the document uh, is presented to us. In, uh, it, was, it was photocopied already. This document, which contains a certain, a certain pink, paper, pink colored paper there, was supposed to be an interesting document because it's supposed to be a description of Southeast Asia based on the travels he undertook, written supposedly by Ferdinand Magellan. So it is said, that Ferdinand Magellan had written an account of Southeast Asia, including portions of the Philippines, before he even landed on the Philippines. But in due, in, by uh, thorough examining the document, it appears that this is a fake document of Magellan, apparently a copy of the work of uh, Duarte Barbosa. Then there's another document there, uh, a much finer way of, uh, of writing it, but then again, still very, very difficult to read the document because unless one is familiar with um, the paleography of the 16th century. Another example of the, this is the list of the crew uh, with their, with, uh, with, uh, I, I think this is a document about the list of those who died in the expedition. So on the other side, on the left side, you have a very, very complicated paleo. It looks like an Arabic script. But on the other side, you have a much better uh, way, uh, handwriting. This other side, uh, this other handwriting was actually taken from the Museo Naval because it, it looks like a, a readable document. It is because it is only written in 1790s because it was the work of Martin Fernandez de Navarrete who copied the documents from the archives of Seville in the handwriting of the 1790s. So you can expect that it is a much better way of looking at the documents. So anybody who is interested to work on the Magellan expedition, I would encourage to go to the Museo Naval and read the works of Martin Fernandez de Navarrete instead of reading the documents in the Archivo General de Indias because of the difficult uh, uh, information we got there. But what do we get out of these documents? What narratives can we derive out of them? 
I said there in the introduction, a number of early Filipino historians built their, the foundation of nationalist historiography on this encounter in the Battle of Mactan, establishing the Filipino sense of racial and cultural homogeneity through this native chief whose real identity remains enshrouded in mystery. Except for few surviving folk oral narratives, Lapu-Lapu's identity only emerged through the sketchy references from the accounts of Magellan's crew, who most, cert most certainly have not seen him. But much, as I said, of what we got, because the major character in the Battle of Mactan was Lapu-Lapu, were Lapu-Lapu, and Magellan. But how far do we know these people? We know so much of Magellan because much of the materials were written by the Spaniards. And of course, those who joined the expedition wrote extensively about Magellan. And therefore, we virtually know Magellan. I could identify, I could even describe how Magellan would look like. He was actually limping uh, because his leg was actually shattered in the Battle of Morocco. So he's not like, uh, he does not walk like a real soldier. But then he was actually a man who was short and he was limping. But what about Lapu-Lapu? We have very, very little information about Lapu-Lapu. In fact, the, the Pigapeta narrative, the Hines de Macra narrative, only mention of Lapu-Lapu as one who apparently refused to kiss the hand of Humabon, but it was never mentioned that he fought in the Battle of Mactan or how he even looked like. So we never had any a picture of who Lapu-Lapu was. But then we got an, a picture of him as a young, muscular guy. The idea is interesting because it only came out that idea of a young Lapu-Lapu, muscular, warrior-like, was actually derived only from a 1920 or a 1930 narrative, which is a fictional narrative and based largely from supposedly oral accounts. And it became popular because Vicente Gullas a very, very prominent writer in Cebu wrote and published a, a book which is actually fictional, but then succeeding writers took them as if they are historical. In fact, there was a certain newspaper around 1930 which says, oh, there's a new finding about the Battle of Mactan and the one who killed Magellan was not actually Lapu-Lapu, but the son of Lapu-Lapu and all these things. But these are apocryphal materials. We don't really have historical uh, evidence on them. And in fact, based on the few historical evidence that we got, they remain to be simply fictional and legendary accounts. Now, we have a document. It says that therefore that Lapu-Lapu was actually, this is at least, this is a written document, almost written 20 years after the Battle of Mactan, and therefore, in a way, it's reliable. It's written by a Portuguese chronicler, a royal chronicler, who certainly had access to primary information. They may not be written at all, but they were definitely informations extracted from uh, prisoners of the Portuguese, and therefore, they must have been comparatively reliable as compared to the legends which had been propagated throughout history. In fact, the monument that we have a young muscular guy was only, was only made around 1960s when Ferdinand Marcos ordered that a monument honoring uh, Lapu-Lapu should be built. But as I said, most of the informations were taken from the few Pigapeta accounts and from the legends that had been popularized in the early 1920s. Now, we have very, therefore, very, very little information as to, as to the Battle of Mactan. But later researchers, more information were coming out because of the works of a number of scholars, Filipino, myself, and uh, Spaniards and Portuguese, we are coming up with substantial information which provide us a much bigger picture, a much better picture of the Battle of Mactan from which this diorama of Sulu Garden Miagao is taken from. Uh, um, so for that reason, the, the diorama that we got there, that we, that we built there, 
was actually based this time on archival documents, on eyewitness accounts. And therefore, we can expect that they are the more reliable depiction of the history of the Battle of Mactan. One thing we know is the Battle of Mactan was fought by a number of a thousand men of Lapu-Lapu. Probably the estimate is from 2,000 to 1,500 against the men of Magellan who were only about 60 or even less. So it was really an outnumbered battle on the part of Magellan and uh, in, in relation with uh, Lapu-Lapu's uh, men. And, but then the Battle of Mactan was not actually a big in terms of the casualty, despite the fact that it was a big event, despite the fact that it was the, the battle was fought by a substantial number of people on the part of the natives, the casualty was actually small. How small? The Spaniards incurred eight men who died, including Magellan, and the natives only incurred a casualty of about 15 or not less than, not more than, not even 20 casualties. So in a way, the Battle of Mactan, in terms of the numbers of the casualties involved, it was small. In terms of the numbers to fought, it was big. But in terms of the magnitude of its impact in the history of the Philippines, it was certainly very, very important. And that's precisely the reason why the construction, the creation of this diorama of, um, of Sulu Garden is very, very important in correcting a historical narrative and also in highlighting the importance of the Battle of Mactan. Not only that the Filipinos fought against an intruder, but it also highlights the fact that the Filipinos were aware of the need to organize themselves, the need to become one, the need to cooperate with each other because of the possibility that somewhere along the way, if not Magellan, somebody else will come and colonize the Philippines. And I think precisely that is the value of the Battle of Mactan, of the defense of the Polaco, of the islands of Mactan. It was significant because it signifies the determination of the Filipino to repel a foreign intruder and savor and continually savor the joy of freedom that they have always been familiar with. Thank you very much. And probably if there will be questions, we can probably entertain the questions. Thank you for that, Dr. Hirona. Thank you for that, Dr. Hirona. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, yes. All right. We have a few questions. Someone is asking about where they could uh, purchase the book. Oh, well, of course, they can purchase the book from us. Or they can email us and then you can see. Uh, I, I think I, I, I missed, I, I can show later on uh, Janine the the YouTube channel we have. So if they are interested to continue um, reading materials or uh, watching a, a new information on the history of the Philippines, because as I specialize on the early period of colonization, I wanted to make a lot of corrections in our textbook histories. And these are all derived from primary sources from the uh, archives in Spain and in the Philippines. So I could say that uh, with certain uh, sense of faith that um, the corrections that I'm going to make here are, in a way, um, would be of uh, help for the students uh, to, uh, to, to rectify uh, certain myths that we have always embraced for a long time. Mm -hmm. We are showing now the YouTube uh, channel of Dr. Hirona. You could see it in the screen. So do subscribe to his channel. And they're, it's very good for educators and teachers, especially for the Vibal group, homeschool parents and students also. 
So another question, sir, is um, it looks like this is really your life's work. Yeah. How long have you researched on this? It's, I would say uh, the, the entire span of the work, uh, Janine, would take 10 years almost. It took me about 12, 12 or 13 times going back to on seasonal research in the archives of Spain, Portugal, and Italy. So it's a really a tedious job. Uh, and it costs a lot of money, but then I got good enough because I got grants for doing research and also occasional lectures in Europe that enable that uh, actually finance my, my travels at the same time. So it's really, but it, the more important thing there is the, the time spent in doing research, in studying the paleography, the handwriting, in, in knowing the languages, you have to be familiar with Italian, with Portuguese, and Spanish document, uh, Spanish language, especially in the 16th century, because certain nuances in the languages uh, at the time were quite different from the nuances that we have today mm. in modern Spanish and it's Italian. True. Yeah, so it's true. That's true. From all this research that you've had, what were the top three myths that you heard, like ridiculous myths you heard about the Battle of Mactan? Yeah, one thing there is that we said that we that we heard uh, Janine that Lapulap was supposed to possess uh, anting anting or agima, and it okay. is said that ah, that's uh, that's one thing. And he says that um, uh, it was actually actually because of this um, the the main weapon that uh, Lapulap was said to be using was actually a alpo or this uh, pestle, and it is said that it was uh, because of the pestle that. Uh, Lapu-Lapu had a training on how to strike a certain object and it was supposedly his father who, uh, who taught him also possessing equally certain kind of a magical power and this, uh, so these are some of the myths about uh, Lapu-Lapu also another myth we have is that Lapu-Lapu actually uh, was not native of uh, Cebu of Mactan, he was actually mm -hmm. a migrant uh, from Borneo one possible explanation there is uh, the typical mindset in the 1970s. The anthropologists at the time would have a term for that, big tradition and small tradition concept. Meaning to say, because of the Philippines, we have a very, very low regard for the Philippines. So we always regard something as something great, as something important, something coming out from somewhere else, but never from the Philippines. So we borrowed from a big tradition and we believe that Lapu-Lapu, supposedly because he has a sophisticated culture, could not have been born, could not have lived in the Philippines, but could have lived somewhere else in a certain society where, where a more sophisticated civilization flourishes. So I think that's a, that's a, that has been debunked already by contemporary yeah. uh, anthropological theories. So I think that's, again, another myth. The myth also that Lapu-Lapu was young, uh, again, it's also another myth that we have to contend with um, because I think we always associate a warrior or a chieftain as young because he has to go to war. But you have to understand that, is, again, we are now revising the notion of a powerful chieftain. We have to remember that Kumabun was a powerful chieftain, very, very rich, but he is not a warrior. If you look at the image of Kumabun, he was fat, he was short, he was does not, he does not yeah, reflect the typical yeah. war. He's not. But where did his power come? It comes from his control of insular trade of Cebu. It's not by way of war. It's by way of trade of international vessels docking in Cebu, paying their taxes to, to, to Humabon. And Humabon had control of these foreign goods. He became the main distributor of goods in the insular part villages of Cebu. And that is where his power and his wealth lies because the other chieftains became dependent to him because they also wanted to get hold of these foreign goods and therefore they have to submit themselves to the power of Humabon. So we have to revise the notion that we only associate power with being young. And apparently that is also the concept of the people who concocted the myth of Lapu-Lapu as a young warrior. No longer today, we have to understand that Older chieftain, chieftains at the time were most of them were actually older people because it does not depend on your energy. Your power does not depend on your energy, but it depends on your experience, on your knowledge of warfare, and for that reason, that's why we are always associate old people as the repository mm -hmm. of wisdom. And that's precisely yeah. what happened in this. I'll, I'll jump off from your image notion of Lapu-Lapu 
Yeah. There are there's a question from NQC. Yeah. Government officials from Bangini Sulu says that Lapu-Lapu is a soldier from Sulu who became a datu in Mactan. Is there proof for this in your research? That's a question. Yeah, it's a very interesting question, but I don't think it's true. We yeah. have to understand, yeah, we have to understand, Janine, that uh, even in that particular period, and the documents would say that the, the Islam, Islamic religion, or the Muslims at the time, were actually confined mostly, at most, uh, on the northern part of Mindanao, but hardly in the Visayas. In fact, the succeeding expeditions would mention that there were small villages, um, small, you say, cluster of villages in, in, the, in the Visayan islands, which embraced Islamic religion and most probably influenced by people from Sulu, mm -hmm. but they do not really practice, practice in the sense that they were faithful Muslims. So um, okay. the Islamic religion at the time or Muslims at the time were probably traveling, but they were not proselytizing. That's the reason why uh, I think the belief that Lapu-Lapu was a migrant from Sulu uh, has no historical basis. It's another part mm -hmm. of uh, apocryphal accounts legendary accounts, but we have, we have no any basis at all. Just running on the same vein with myths, we have a question from Jinky Rose Bayug. Is there any attempt to rectify textbook contents pertaining to the Battle of Mactan, especially in basic education textbooks? So these are, um, if ever there are myths, would you know if this was rectified or has there any research about these books before it was published, um, did they ever go to you? Apart, part of Janine, the, the first one, because the, 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 the internet has a certain problem earlier. Is there any attempt to rectify textbook contents pertaining to the Battle of Mactan? I think this is in a particular with some myths that was already published in a textbook. Like, have you ever encountered some of these mistakes? Yeah, but the trouble with that, Janine, is we became only conscious and more and more of the Battle of Mactan in more recent times. No yeah. substantive research has been undertaken within the last 20, 30 years. It's only in more recent times that we became conscious, but especially because we are getting towards the 500-year celebration, we become more and more analytical. We become more and more conscious of the role of the Battle of Mactan, and for that reason, more, more attempts to weed out the legends and the myths out of what we have always known they, uh, become more pronounced in more recent times. So I think hopefully, hopefully, if the government would be open to materials we have, to documentary materials we have, then probably we started moving out from the legendary accounts that we have. Uh, as I said, my, my work on Lapu-Lapu was um, derived from primary documents from English translations also, because there are some people who doubted that the translation, that my Portuguese translation of the work of Gaspar, Gaspar Correa was probably problematic. I asked, I, I verified certain works published in the 19th century in English translation, and they fit with, with my interpretation and my translation. I even asked a Portuguese historian recently whether my translation is wrong. He said, no, 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 it's perfectly correct. So it's a historian specializing on Orient. So meaning to say, uh, I think the preponderance of evidence tells us that there are myths that we have to forego. And I think mm -hmm. if we are nationalistic enough and we mm -hmm. wanted to really teach through reliable history, we have to learn to undo errors in our history and mm -hmm. accept historical facts as the very basis for our nationalist ideology. Exactly, sir. I think um, the first step is really consciousness. So at this point, the, the, the reason why we have the National Centennial Committee and for us to be commemorating it brings up a lot of lessons. Ito po yung tama. So like, like taking away all the myths about the story, right? We have a question. I'll go back to your language because you mentioned it a while ago. We have a question by Joseph Solis Alberici. He said, do you think that we should consider the idea of bringing back Spanish as a language into the core curriculum? Not just to have every one of us, not just to have every one of us would be able to understand the nuances of our Philippine history written in the Spanish language, but also this will be based on the Spanish language as lenses. What do you suppose though? Should we yeah, bring back I think Spanish? Janine, 
Yeah, in some way, I would say on a selective basis, on a certain context, Spanish is important. Today, we have to consider that we are on what you call globalization, mondialization, as, as the French philosopher once said. We are engaged in an, an ever-expanding world that we are now. And always we associate um, the, the, the need to respond to the future. Meaning, say, as we go out of our little world, we always think of, um, of meeting the future by preparing for the future, especially by languages. For example, we study Korean, we study Japanese, we study Chinese because there is a demand in the future for employment. But what about our task? Isn't it that as we move out of our little world, as we go, as we brace for the future, we should also go back to our past that we may use the lessons of the past in, uh, to guide us in our journey towards the future. And that means to say, strengthening our historical knowledge. And the only way we can go back and make sense of our history, especially Spanish colonial history, is by, uh, by knowing Spanish. We always condemn Spanish colonialism. But the question is, how many people read the documents? How many people have really gone to the archives and really make sense of the documents? Much of our condemnations, okay, I would agree to the fact that there are certain uh, say abuses committed, but to what extent were they? But what about the positive thing? But what about the sources that you are using to condemn or to affirm the good things that they have? Unless we know Spanish in a way, for those who are studying history, we cannot really make sense of our history. We always condemn that it's Eurocentric. But more so, if we do not study their language, then it will become true and true Eurocentric without any defense on our part, without any part on our, uh, as a people, who would be able to explain this Eurocentric materials unless we Filipinos themselves study these documents and speak the language of the documents. I yeah. think that's the only point that we can avoid Eurocentrism, we can avoid uh, European prejudice if we ourselves appropriate this is a language of postmodernity if we appropriate the works the instruments of colonization that the spaniards had by understanding the language and understanding their history therefore spanish language i think is a must especially for historians for students of history and for those who wanted to understand the text okay thank you for that sir we will move our conversation to more specifically about Lapu-Lapu because there are quite a number of questions just talking about Lapu-Lapu. Yes. The first one would be from Da Gat. This is from the National Quincentennial um, Facebook page. Are we interested to correct the name of C. Lapu-Lapu hmm. with the C.I.? What do you yeah. suppose? Should we yeah. keep it to Lapu-Lapu or uh, C. Lapu-Lapu? Yeah, that's one one. That's only one portion of the of the names of Lapula in, in terms of uh, we understanding who really Lapula was. The name C Lapulapu. Sometimes it's written as S I. Sometimes it's written in some dog as C I. And even the word Lapulapu. Sometimes it, there is a hyphen. Sometimes C Kulap Kulapu. Sometimes it's written mm -hmm. in various ways. Even in the 16th century documents, the name Lapulapu had a variety of. Uh, way of writing that. But the main issue there also, Jenny, to be able to really make sense of even the name of Lapu-Lapu himself is to understand where does the name come from by itself? How, where, why is it that this guy was named Lapu-Lapu? I think mm -hmm. we, can, we can understand that if we go back to the culture of the pre-colonial Filipinos as to how they name the people at the time. There are two ways of naming um, the pre-colonial natives at the time at the time of their birth, when there are certain phenomena in their environment at the time of their birth, then they adopt that as the name of the child. For example, okay. there is a kidlat, then the child is called kidlat. Okay. But the second naming actually Janine came when they grow old. It became a sobriquet of their accomplishment. So they adopt another name or they change their name according to how they conducted their lives or they accomplished themselves mm -hmm. uh, in their lives. So if they became a, a, a warrior, they became, they sometimes were named as uh, uh, Katakutan, or they are sometimes mm -hmm. named as 
Dumarao, for example, the chipte in Luzon is called Dumarao because he became a conqueror. He conquered a lot of villages, so his name. Probably the Pulapu could have been named as such because the dictionary of Mindrida spoke of lapus, lapus, meaning to say a very, very agile thing. So it would be, be possible that Lapu-Lapu was identified as a warrior because of the name Lapu-Lapu because he was a very agile guy, like a wind that can swiftly move around. Mm -hmm. So probably by going to the origin of the name through certain dictionaries written in the 16th century, uh, 17th century, then we'd be able to make sense not only of how Lapu-Lapu should be called and also why he was called as such. So that's, that's the reason yes. why historical research is important. That's very interesting, actually. We have one question, no? Uh, from Angelica Dote. In your point of view, sir, what do you think is the most remarkable character trait of Lapu-Lapu? Well, again, uh, that's another problematic aspect of Lapu-Lapu's uh, biography, uh, Janine. Because, as I said, mm -hmm. we have very, very little information as to how who Lapu-Lapu was. Uh, as I said, but you might probably ask, where, where did Lapu -Lapu, where did we get a knowledge of Lapu-Lapu? I said, it's most probably from the people who were imprisoned in Mactan at the, uh, in Cebu and Mactan at the time. Some of the, some of the Spaniards were left behind, at least eight of them, and probably witnessed and had a personal encounter of Lapu-Lapu, so we get to know about him. But we don't really know who he really was. The only thing we got is, from, as I said, from the perspective of Gaspar Maspar Correa and a little from Pigapeta, which says that Lapu-Lapu refused to accept uh, Humabon as his boss. Because Magellan told yeah, Humabon or Lapu-Lapu uh, that he has to, if he really accepted Spain, because uh, several documents, I, this is not my invention, these are based on documents that says that Lapu-Lapu actually accepted, accepted, it's not Sula, some, some people there, some historians said, oh, it's Sula who accepted, no, 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 it's Lapu-Lapu, very clear, Lapu-Lapu accepted Magellan, accepted Charles V, but then what he could not accept is to kiss the hand of Raja Humao. Because said, how can I kiss the hand and submit myself to a man whom I have been ruling for a long time? One reason there, Janine, is because it is said by Hines de Mapra that Lapu-Lapu and Mabun were actually brothers-in-law. Uh, it's quite interesting, a family feud. Uh, the reason, yes. yeah, because, uh, so that's, that's one thing. So, but the point, is, the only thing that we know about the character of Lapu-Lapu is the fact that he would not kill to the, uh, to the demand of Magellan to accept uh, Spanish sovereignty by way of kissing the hand of Mabon. That's the only thing. Other than that, we don't really know. If ever we know of anything, it might be legendary, it might be mythical, but it has no base, or it has to be cor corroborated by a scrap of historical document, at least secondary sources, if not uh, eyewitness accounts. So we don't really All right. know it all right, so I'll move our question to the climax of the narrative. A lot of people are asking this. Did Lapu-Lapu really kill Magellan? Or, or was Magellan killed by one of Lapu-Lapu's men? Well, that's an inter of course, that's true. true. It's not only one of these men, by several men, most probably. Uh, mm. There are several uh, narrative accounts which said that Lapu-Lapu was actually, uh, Magellan was actually killed, never by Lapu-Lapu. We don't even see in the documents where Lapu-Lapu was. There was no any mention in the Battle of Mactan where Lapu-Lapu was positioned or was he was fighting or he was there. Probably he was sitting somewhere there directing the battle, but he was never mentioned as actively engaged in the Battle of Mactan. The other thing we know about this, about Magellan is, Magellan was ganged up by a number of warriors of the Pulapu. And he was killed by hitting. Several accounts says that one, they claim that Magellan was hit on the head by stones. The, but the, the natives of Bactan were not using sophisticated rivers. There were arrows, there were spears, but not, we never saw anything about cannons. But most of them mentioned of stones being thrown upon the a helmet of, La, of Magellan. Mm -hmm. You have to understand, Janine, that I, I, I did a thorough inventory of the cargo of the Magellan expedition. I went through mm -hmm. the cargo of the Magellan I looked at the bullets that they carried um, then for the archivals, how many archivals, how many uh, armors there. 
The Pula Magellan was actually fully armed, fully uh, armored. And the only place, the only place of his body, part of his body which is exposed would be the face, the portion of his arms, and portion of his legs. And therefore, there are only three things that could possibly uh, hit him. One would be a stone that would be that would okay. hit his face. Yeah. The other was an arrow, and it says that he was hit by a, an arrow on the leg, a poison arrow. And the other was a spear that hit him on the arms and also on the face. So okay. there were several versions as to how he was uh, he was uh, hit by these uh, natives of Mactan. But the issue is, why was he killed if he was a veteran soldier, if he was fully mm -hmm. armored? Quite an interesting detail. One of the chroniclers says, based on his interview of the natives of Mactan in the post-Mactan uh, event, he says that because Magellan raised to a person who is very, very close to his heart, who was being ganged up, by the natives of Mactan. So he forgot his own safety and simply rushed okay. into this person. And this guy was supposedly the son of Ferdinand Magellan. He was the bastard son of Ferdinand Magellan, Cristobal Rabelo, who also died in the Battle of Mactan the way Magellan died. And that's another interesting account that Magellan had a son, the bastard son, was already in his youth at the time, probably 17 or 18 years old, and he died in that battle. Okay. I never heard that yet. Yeah. <laughs> That's a new one. Yeah. So I just have a question because you're part of the of the committee, right? For the 500 years. Yeah. We are now celebrating the Philippine part. When will we celebrate the Spanish part? Or is there another counterpart celebration? Yeah, that's an interesting question. This uh, Spain is celebrating that in 2022 because of the arrival of the uh, surviving crew of the Magellan expedition in Seville, September, I think, 8th, uh, like that. So th that would be the celebration for Spain. Uh, they would not be celebrating here the, uh, the, uh, the landing of Magellan, it's the Philippine celebration, but Europe and Spain especially would be celebrating it in September of 2022 because of uh, the circumnavigation of the world when 18 crew of the Magellan expedition returned and survived the ordeal of the journey, which cost so much lives on the part of the crew. And in fact, quite interesting today, Janine, 18 returned, but there were others who were in prison. But as to how many crew there was in Magellan, we don't really know. They, the, the official record says 235 because that's what the king says. 235, and because also the allocation of the provisions for the expedition for two years was actually measured, was actually allocated for that particular number of crew. But we do not know that until today. Why? Yeah. Because Magellan bring in other crew, Portuguese, because it was only allowed 25 Portuguese in the entire expedition, but Magellan realized that the danger in the expedition in the sea does not come from the storm. It does not come from shipwreck. It came from your own crew. So he has to surround himself with more loyal men. And most of them were, of course, Portuguese. So we don't really know the exact number, even today that we are celebrating. All right. So it looks like you're, this is going to be a very busy year for you. That's right. Like yeah. The early part of the year, it's all Philippines. And then most probably when we do the um, Sevilla part, they will always call on you to be a speaker also there. Yeah, actually, Janine, we already started in Spain the celebration five years ago. Uh, in fact, we mm -hmm. were invited by the Ministry of Defense to uh, meet with the king. There were about 50 historians all over the world who were specialized in Magellan. And we met there at one time uh, with the king of Spain. Um, and I also met with the admiral because the admiral, after a while, I, I, he knew that I'm working on the Magellan expedition. They, they asked me to submit a paper for the, uh, for the uh, commemorative book that Spain is putting up. And there were about 20 historians all over the world and the only Asian uh, who submitted mm -hmm. was, uh, oh. it, yeah, to, for the article. But, so we had started uh, the celebration uh, five years ago, Janine, during the, to, to commemorate the signing of the contract between Magellan and Charles in the monastery of Valladolid in Spain. And that was the beginning. And since then, I've been giving talks in Portugal, in University of Seville, in other parts of uh, Europe, 
for the 500 years to, in a way, to promote the celebration, not only on the part of the Spaniards, of the Europeans, but also mm -hmm. on the part of the Philippines, that we have something to celebrate. I think that's the main purpose there, to show to the world that we have our own history and we have a place in this most important event of the century, the 500 years circumnavigation of the world. We are so proud of you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> More power to you, especially for the entire year. This is going to be a very busy year for you. Yeah, so to close off, we have a very nice question. This is from Iloilo. Hello, Dr. Herona. In your own point of view, how relevant is the celebration of the Battle of Mactan that transpired 500 years ago to the modern Philippines? And what are the lessons that the young generations can get from this epic battle? This will be our last question. One thing, Janine, is I think the relevance of the Battle of Mactan was already recognized almost 100 years ago. We have to understand that we are not, we are not the only ones who recognize this. Because the main point of the Battle of Mactan it is it became an inspiration, as a rallying point for our national identity as a people and for our resistance against the Europeans. In fact, the first time that they make use of the concept of the Battle of Mactan and Lapu Lapu was in around 1888, when in Manila, certain Masonic personalities were putting up Masonic lodges in the Manila area. And they make use as their codes for these lodges, the name of Lapu Lapu and Mactan. That's the first time that I have ever encountered in my research that the Filipinos began to recognize the value of the Battle of Mactan as a rallying point of national identity and resistance. And I think the same story uh, is, uh, applies to modern man. Today, it becomes a rallying point of our identity that we did not, of course, simply stand in awe of the Europeans' might and power, but we resisted them. When they need to resist, we resisted them. Of course, Lapu-Lapu resisted only as a chieftain in the village in Opon and as probably as an overlord in the islands of Mactan. But you have to understand that heroism, in a way, is also symbolic. When you resist only in Mactan, you actually make use of Mactan as the, as the representation of the entire Philippines. When you say Rizal fought for the Philippines, of course, he did probably fight for the people of Mindanao, probably in some, uh, other parts in the Philippines, mm -hmm. but he became the icon of Filipino identity. And I think the same is true with Lapu-Lapu. Therefore, it happened 500 years ago, but today Lapu-Lapu stands as a rallying point of Filipino identity. As one historian once put it, Lapu-Lapu's might, Lapu-Lapu's glory comes from the fact that he conquered the conqueror. And I think it's also the sense of pride of Filipinos that yes. conquered the conqueror. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Herona. That was very inspiring. Actually, ito may yung barili mo ko. Thank you for, your, for sharing with us your life's work, Dr. Herona. It's going to be a very busy year nga for you, like I mentioned, and more power. For everyone who is watching, this is, um, if you would like to learn more about the book and about Dr. Herona's research, is Ferdinand Magellan, The Armada de Maloko, and the European Discovery of the Philippines. It's over here. You could reach Dr. Herona also through his YouTube channel. He has been putting out a lot of good research on, um, I mentioned Santo Nino. I also saw last night uh, something about Antonio Pigafetta also. So do subscribe to his YouTube channel, Danny Herona. For Chinatown Museum and the Iloilo Museum of Contemporary Art, we would also like everyone to subscribe to Museums Matter. For most of the year, we have content for children. We will also be showcasing our art exhibits and also some of our historical exhibits. For April, we will be having collections. So it's up again, especially for those who are history enthusiasts and our collectors. We would also like to thank Sulu Garden Foundation, 
who is located in Magao, Iloilo, you could reach them at their Facebook page, sulu.garden. They also have an email, info at sulugarden.com. If you check out their website, you will get to see updates about their diorama. So the goal for their di diorama is to actually be launched on March 27. Next week, we would like to invite you to join us as we get to see how the actual diorama was designed and how it was executed. Chinatown Museum page is also found in Facebook and we're also in Instagram. If you have any ideas whatsoever in terms of content, do let us know at chinatownmuseumph at gmail.com. For Iloilo Museum of Contemporary Art, our email is Iloilo Museum of Contemporary Art at gmail.com. It's rather long. And lastly, we would like to thank Vibal, especially to the teachers, the educators, um, the parents who are also watching. Thank you, everyone. See you all again next week.